Welcome, searchers and seekers. We are in the book of uh, 2 Samuel, chapter 11, and we have the fascinating story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, and this is one of the most infamous passages in the Old Testament. Uh, basically, if you haven't heard it, it it's just an unbelievable story. Uh, David is attracted to this beautiful woman, Bathsheba, uh, but unfortunately, she's married. Now, it doesn't stop David. He has her husband killed. Uh, so David really, King David really is a murderer. He murdered a man in order to possess his wife. Even though at this time, we've already been told by the text, David has four or five wives, many concubines, uh, but he wants Bathsheba. So he is willing to murder uh, her, her husband. And this is the story of that. This is absolutely fascinating uh, on many levels. Uh, how was this allowed to be in the Hebrew Scriptures? Uh, I don't think uh, David or any of the kings would really allow this. It makes kings look terrible. Uh, but it could be. It could have been somehow included later on. Uh, another theory is that after the exile, uh, people were disillusioned and unhappy with how having a king turned out. Uh, so then you uh, maybe include these negative stories about how kings operate. Uh, this is a fascinating story on many levels. And uh, for the idea of the Davidic um, uh, Messiah theme, that there would be uh, a, a Davidic Messiah, really we have to look at this. Well, what kind of man was David? Who was he? Uh, he he was a murderer. Uh, he uh, had many many wives and concubines. Um, he in some ways was uh, a warlord. Uh, we don't really know. He, he was a violent man, a violent man, a military man. He had many many people killed in the course of battle. Um, he took over uh, the original city of Jerusalem by force. Who, right, even even what we know from the text uh, is is highly problematic. And how could this kind of figure be perceived as definitive for messiahship for this lineage? That becomes highly problematic, and you rarely see people talking about this. Uh, David was in all likelihood, a guerrilla warrior, a warlord, a murderer. Why is he emblematic of the best of the times? So, chapter 11, the story of David and Bathsheba. Um, much of his army is off fighting the Ammonites. The Ammonites are one of many enemies of Israel at this time. A uh, war seems endemic. Um, we've talked about that before. So uh, King David is in Jerusalem. He's on his roof, uh, so a lot of flat roofs. Uh, it would be a, a place, even to this day, in the Mediterranean, uh, where it's sort of an open-air room. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house. Again, that's sort of just, uh, just like a patio uh, on the roof. He saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. So this is what King David can do. Kings can do. He, he's interested in a woman. He sends someone to look after her. So this is not, in a sense, a normal male uh, who would have to introduce himself to her. He has power, and he uses it to get his way. It was reported that this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite is the man that David is going to have killed. He's going to have him murdered. So David sent messages to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. So uh, there's a, a comment there that explains uh, she had her period. So before she... Uh, uh, met up with David. She was not pregnant. There was no way she could be 
uh, preg pregnant with by her husband uh, Uriah the Hittite. That's the reason that is there. She returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So they know that uh, David is the father, not Uriah. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David, so sent him back from the battlefront to Jerusalem. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go to your own house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house and this is because of um, sort of battlefield protocol battlefield laws that you do not sleep with women uh, when you're active in the army even if i guess you come back home so he's being very pious when they told david uriah did not go down to his house david said to uriah you have just come from your journey why did you not go down to your house uriah said to david the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I go into my house to eat and drink and to lie with my life? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. So uh, the two armies uh, described in two different ways. It's Israel and Judah, so sort of separate there. And also the ark of God, the ark of the covenant, is also in battle too. Uh, so De, uh, so uh, Uriah will not sleep with his wife. Now the Ark and the armies uh, don't um, live in Booth, so it probably should be at Sukkot. So Sukkot should be more of a place name. The army lives in tents. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence, and made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. So now David tries to, to make him drunk, and makes him stay another day, uh, plies him with alcohol, makes him drunk in the hopes that he will go in and have relations with Bathsheba. But he doesn't. He's very pious. So the story is, is really showing uh, Uriah the Hittite as very pious, as following all the laws of not having pleasure while the, the rest of his fellow soldiers are on the battlefield. So uh, David could not cover up his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, he could not get Uriah the Hittite to sleep with her. So he's going to kill him. And verse 14 goes, In the morning, David wrote a letter, a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. So Uriah, it's very ironic, is actually going to carry the letter with instructions of how he is going to be killed uh, to uh, Joab. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. So this is David's plan to kill Uriah. He, he's going to be right in the forefront of the, uh, on the battle, the front lines, and then Joab is told to pull back. So just sort of leave him there with his men, and uh, he will be killed because he's left alone on the front lines. As Joab was beginning to besiege the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there would be valiant warriors. The men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, When you have finished telling the king all the news about the fighting, then if the king's anger rises and he says to you, Why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall who killed abimelech son of jerubal did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him why do you go so near the wall then you shall say your servant uriah the hittite is dead also so if david complains give him the news 
that David wants to hear. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent to tell him. And David replies, uh, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. So he's like saying, well, that's war. Uh, uh, people get killed. That happens. So a very callous uh, remark from David. Now the sword devours one, now another. A very, uh, very ironic and uh, almost evil. Uh, this is such a well-told story, and it brings out this lack of character in David. Well, Bathsheba hears about this, she mourns, and eventually she becomes one of David's wives and bore him a son. But that is not the end of the story, for there is a judgment coming. The thing that David had done was displeasing to Yahweh, and Yahweh sent Nathan, a prophet, to David. He came to David and said, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and grew it with them and with his children. He, it used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. So this is a metaphor for Uriah and his wife Bathsheba. So this ewe lamb is, is like a pet. Uh, it's like a part of the family. And it's a very powerful story. Now there was a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, as Yahweh lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's daughter, and your master's wives to your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added much more. Why have you despised the word of Yahweh to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. For you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So an explanation of why the sword is in his house. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. And the rest of Second Samuel will show that. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbors. And he shall lie with your and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against Yahweh. And Nathan said to David, Now Yahweh has put away your sin, you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned Yahweh, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. So uh, Bathsheba is pregnant and gives birth, but the child will die. So in, and, and again, we see what does this mean theologically uh, and for human causality. Uh, is that this innocent baby dies uh, as a result of this judgment against David. So that's probably one of the least appealing parts of this story. Uh, but they conceive and bear another child. We know that second child as Solomon. So Bathsheba gives birth, and they call him Solomon, uh, which they here in Samuel interpret as um, his replacement. So Solomon's name means his replacement in this text, but in First Chronicles, uh, Shalomo or Solomon comes from Shalom, the, the word peace. So that's the folk derivation there. Uh, he's also called Jedediah, which may be a, 
uh, a court name for Solomon. That's why that name may be there. So it's interesting that Solomon, who will become king, uh, is the result of David m murdering Uriah the Hittite. So talk about strange family matters. So we can look at the question of uh, the character of David and why it is being reported in uh, Samuel. Uh, Chronicles does not report this story of, of Bathsheba. And Chronicles also has a, a nicer derivation of the word uh, Solomon, the name Solomon from Shalom, uh, meaning peace. So Solomon's name is associated with the idea of peace, where here it is called the replacement. Uh, so one possibility is that this text, this story in Samuel, uh, may be written many years later uh, at some point and is an attempt to characterize the problems with kingship, uh, that this is how kings can operate. They're, so, they're too powerful. Uh, so in a sense, this is, uh, from the perspective of political philosophy, this uh, could be seen as an argument against the absolute power of kings. Um, and it also calls into question the whole um, office of, of kingship. And we've seen in the Hebrew scriptures that this idea of kingship uh, was not universally acclaimed. Uh, there were a lot of uh, perceived problems with kingship, and this may be a story that relates to that. It's hard to believe that uh, King David, if this was written at the time, would have allowed this story to be promulgated. Um, but it is one of the most fascinating stories in the Hebrew Scriptures. It gives us uh, a, a sense of, uh, just, just from terms of literature, just from study of anthropology, just from a study of history, uh, it gives us a lot of insight and data and wisdom about how and why human beings behave the way they do. And King David is an example of a very sinful human being. Now, uh, as I said before, he's taken as a model, uh, not only as a human being, but as uh, the Messiah, as uh, uh, the greatest king of Israel. And this kind of behavior, uh, murder, uh, is way out of the ambit of what we would think uh, an uh, exemplar should be. Um, so this really calls into question this, the rationale for the Davidic messiahship, for the Davidic lineage. This is not just a minor mistake. This is a major, major mistake that shows an amazing character flaw and uh, a lack of uh, personal development. How could someone reach this point? How could someone who has many wives and many concubines uh, seek another woman uh, at the cost of killing one of his best soldiers? This is not just a minor infraction. This, this says something about a, a total lack of character on David's part and it makes you question his whole personality structure.